Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Ellie Fields. I'm not Steve Wexler. And I lead one of the development areas here at Tableau. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Steve today. Um, you're probably here because Steve is really, really, really good at survey data. Uh, or you may be here because you read one of his blogs or his white paper on survey data. Or perhaps you read the book that he co-authored with Andy Cockreave and uh, Jeffrey Schaefer called The Big Book of Dashboards. Or maybe you uh, saw one of his excellent Tableau public visits or attended his seminar. Or you may have watched him in Iron Viz a number of years ago. Um, I guess you could say that he is really a master of survey data. And he, uh, he also is uh, always teaching in a very thoughtful way back into the community about survey data. Um, but that, that would actually be understating things a little bit. Uh, Steve has also done consulting for a wide range of very prestigious companies, from Deloitte to Stanford to The Economist and many, many more. Um, but even that would be understating things a little bit. He, uh, he also leads a 12 to 15 piece band, depending on the day, and is an avid music lover. Um, but even that would be understating things a little bit. Uh, when I think of the Tableau community, with a key word there being community, I think of Steve. He not only contributes often and with extremely high quality, um, but he also learns with an open mind. And he offers his gratitude very freely. Uh, he's a Zen master, and a few years ago he wrote a note to all of the Zen saying, I look at each of you and remember something I've learned and grown from. Uh, to me, Steve exemplifies what we look for in the Tableau Zen Masters with mastery, teaching, and innovation. He's also a lovely guy. I've had the luck of knowing him for many years and learning about survey data from him. Welcome, Steve. Hi there. Can you hear me? Actually, I'm Ellie Fields. Um, <laughs> The, um, before we get on, that was, it's very meaningful to have Ellie present. Realize that this is the godmother of Tableau Public. And without Tableau Public, we don't have this. We don't have this conference. We don't have any of this stuff. There are two things I can't do without. Undo <laughs> and Tableau Public. So when you get a chance, express your gratitude, because this conference would have 3,200 people, not 17,000 people. So Ellie and your team and everyone else. Thank you. And thank you for showing up on the last day. This is, um, you are stalwarts. I am enormously impressed. So in any case, I am the founder and principal of Data Revelations. I was, in fact, Tableau's inaugural Iron Biz champion. That was in 1957. And <laughs> I am a five-time Tableau Zen master. I am very proud of that, but realize, and it says that on my, my business card, Tableau Zen Master, and a lot of you have heard me make this point, those of you who haven't. Um, you now know in the community that's an actual thing, correct? You saw that. We, they, we got uh, you know, to come out on stage yesterday morning, and it was lovely. Anyone who's not in the Tableau community, they don't know that's an actual thing. You hand them a business card that says Tableau Zen Master, they think you're a complete tool. Um, now, that said, I am proud of that accomplishment. The thing I'm most proud of, though, in, the, in terms of the thing I'm most proud of and the smartest thing I ever, ever did was marry my wife. But the, the second smartest thing was not trying to write this book on my own, but cajoling, browbeating, and somehow getting uh, Jeffrey Schaefer and Andy, oh my god, look at his suit and boots, Cotgreave, uh, to co-author The Big Book of Dashboards. All right, so here's sort of our little agenda for the day right now as my friend Susan is snacking in front of me, making annoying noises. Um, the single most important thing to get right, showing sentiment, inclination, proclivities. I thought I had that all figured out a while back. I don't. Someone said, no, there's a better way to do this or a different way to do this. Uncertainty and error bars. 73.9% said, you know, surveyed said such and such. You should, but what's your confidence in that? Uh, dealing with basses. If you don't know what a bass is, you will find out soon enough. And then um, 
the kind of the bane of my existence, not so much cutting one question by the results of another, but more filtering or cutting by a check all that apply question. This is kind of half-baked. I'm gonna show you what I've done so far. It's getting really close. And then Q&A. Um, before I do something, though, I would like to present you with my alter ego. And I wanna say the single most important thing in survey data is making sure you get your data set up properly. So. You do not want to mess with this person. There's a lot, I don't want to cover the 20 minutes it takes to show you how to do this. Archana did it in her session. There are a bunch of tools that make this wickedly easy to do. Uh, Alteryx, Easy Morph, and most recently Tableau Prep. They kick ass. I have three, I have an overriding blog post, how to get your data just so, and then how to get it just so with Alteryx, how to get it just so with Easy Morph, and how to get it just so with Tableau Prep. The main thesis is when you download the survey data, assuming you're not using a web connector to whatever tool that you might be using, you're gonna have for each respondent, you're just gonna have one row. And then you're gonna have everything about that one respondent. You know, the demographics and then how they answered this question, this question, this question, et cetera. You will be very unhappy if you leave your data that way. You'll think this is awful, Tableau stinks, eh, why should I be doing this? If instead you just keep a handful of columns and then reshape, make your data tall instead of wide. Tableau calls it a pivot. Most other tools call it an unpivot. I don't care. Just take the thing that's wide and turn it like this. You'll be fine. And in fact, this is kind of really what you want to have the data looking like. So you know, let's look at the original data set and then look at the data set the way that we would want to have it reshaped. So let me bring up some data. So here is some generic survey data in the format that you may have downloaded it from your favorite tool. Maybe there's an extra row or two up at the top giving you a little uh, extra stuff that, you're, you're, that may be useful for you looking in the spreadsheet. But invariably, most of these tools allow you to download the data in label format. So here I have, do you plan, this question is, translates to, do you plan to vote in the upcoming election? And you've got no's, yeses, maybes, or don't knows. This was a benchmarking question, what is your salary? This was a check all that apply question, do you measure this, do you measure this, yes, no? And then there's a whole bunch of Likert scale data. Do you know nine times in this conference I heard people saying Likert? I've been telling you for five years the man's name was Rensis Likert, okay? Do we understand each other? Likert, not Likert, thank you. Makes me so angry. <laughs> In any case, th these things, and, and, and you know, eventually you look at this stuff and go, it's like reading The Matrix. Oh, there's a woman in a red dress walking down the street, et cetera, that type of thing. You can look at this thing and kind of grok it. So that's the data presented one way. Here's exactly the same data, but it's in numeric format. You've got zeros and ones for your check all that apply questions. I hope you do, not zero, not ones and blanks. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then you've got your Likert stuff, and in this case, it's classic one, two, three, four, five. Um, do you agree with these following statements? You know, one means strongly disagree, five means strongly agree, but sometimes a one means something else. Like over here, it means um, I'm extremely dissatisfied, and a five means very satisfied, or sometimes it means very unimportant. That's why you want to have the numbers and the labels, because sometimes you just want to say, hey, I wanted the percentage of people who gave a four or a five. Oh, that's great. But I want to know what a four means and a five means, and sometimes it means this and sometimes it means that. Then you kind of have this little piece here that's going to piece everything together. I call it the question helper. And it just maps everything. Oh, this question ID, this is the human readable form of this thing. Hold on, let me make it so you can see this thing. Okay, let's see, hold on. Zoom in on that. This is the human readable format of this thing. Um, uh, this is the question grouping. And then it's, it's kind of metadata, data about the data. And so over here, I've got these are the check all, the, these are the check all that apply questions. And they all get grouped together in what do you measure, et cetera. So, that's the way we started. The way we want to end up is like this. So instead of one 
one row per respondent, I've got a row for each question that respondent number two, a guy, Generation X, lives in South America, said for each single question. Hey, just a quick note, if you're wondering why did some things get to be anointed their own column and other things got reshaped, you can have something be both as part of your flow. You can say, I want this to be something that's a column and I want it to be reshaped. So if you decide, I really want to cut this by the people, the satisfaction question about um, airline food. You know, I want to see by gender, by location, by age, and by how satisfied people are with airline food, you can certainly go ahead and do that. So that's the way you want to have your data set up. But before we go further, and I didn't make poor Ian spend 20 minutes helping me get the audio on this thing happening, but you're, imagine hearing screeching brakes at the moment, okay? Oh, we can actually hear the screeching brakes, holy crap. Ian's a genius, man. Um, in any case, this is the way I hope your check all that apply questions are going to look. You know, take a look at this row in particular. Right? Completely blank for all the thing. It means this person was too lazy or too bored or didn't bother to answer the question. Right? But that, more and more, I'm not seeing data being coded that way. I'm seeing it look like this. That's bad because you can't tell that they totally you know, not participate in the question, so I shouldn't count them. So very important, you either need to fix that in the data source, or if you can't do that, you need to um, fix it in Tableau. So I'm, I'm not gonna get into how you do this, it's, um, but you're all at the point, this is an intermediate to an advanced session. The recipe is not hard to follow to do this, either on the preparation side or on the other side. So you know you're gonna have access to all these slides, all the links, et cetera. So I've got a PDF that has step-by-step -step instructions that says here's how to take your wide data, make it tall, do everything right. Here's the sample data. If you've got poorly coded questions, and you probably will because the tools are not doing it right, here's how you can fix it on the Tableau prep side. And here's how you can fix it inside Tableau. Say, oh, this isn't working right. I can't, for whatever reason, can't prepare it. You can get it. The other thing is, I'm just seeing a bunch of people um, do and check all that apply questions in a dangerous way, meaning they're not gonna get the right answers all the time. So I've recently updated a blog post on how to do that stuff. On here's the, what, what I would recommend as a good way to encode a check all that apply question. We'll see what the formula for it is in a little bit. All right, what I do want to get to now is showing sentiment and inclination um, and Likert scale stuff, right? Likert, good. And so I saw this blog post and the writer said my kids were ugly. Well, that's not literally what happened. Uh, it was actually this. Someone wrote this blog post saying the case against diverging stacked bar charts. And, and I've been a big proponent of, if you're trying to show sentiment and inclination, I really like the divergent stacked bar chart. And, and it, it's a good post, and you should read it. And I'm going to have links to it. They make a good case for it. Before I could write this really thoughtful retort, you know, go, oh, yeah. Uh, this guy, Daniel Zvinka, any of you heard of him? He's a really talented data visualization guy, statistician outside of Romania. He's making my life difficult because he, I ask him to critique my work and he is ridiculously thoughtful and, and, and makes very good arguments about things. He wrote a killer blog post about the divergent stack bar chart, but he suggested changing something. And I read the thing and went, crap, he's right. Now, people are probably, at least, I'm guessing, a third of you are thinking, all right, I guess I'm supposed to know what a divergent stack bar chart is, but I don't want to raise my hand and, and, and state that. Let me show you an example. This is something that the New York Times published uh, beginning of 2016, uh, showing the propensity of certain politicians to lie or tell the truth. Okay, so, and, and, and you can see, by the way, it's interesting they used orange and purple. And you would think, well, why, can't they, why not use red and green? You probably know about color vision deficiency. Well, they can't use red and blue 
because that's been co-opted. So I, I remember looking at this, man, those are interesting colors. Oh, that's why they're using them. In any case, I see something like this. It's one of the few cases where I'll look at something in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and say, hey, I think there may be a better way to do this. And so um, this was my take on it. And you kind of have the bars, um, um, and the, you're skewing them left and right to show the sentiment. The only thing is, um, let me see if I can get the uh, highlighter thing. The, the biggest problem that people have with this, once they understand and showing how it is, they just can't quite buy Bill Clinton being the most truthful politician in the list. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a, they're, they're, they're just not quite buying it. OK, so this has kind of become my go-to for this type of thing. Um, I think six years ago, I wrote a blog post on how to build one of these things. I have yet to build one of them from scratch. I just copy and paste all the formulas from that one from years ago and use it again and again and again. And um, I should have had both next to each other, but I'm going to go back to the previous one. I want you to look at it, and then I want you to see a, a big and significant difference between that first one and this one. So here's this set of diverging bars. And you can see the inclination is going to, you know, having more proclivity towards lying than telling the truth. And then this set. And yes, the colors are a little bit different, but there's one major difference. Sorry I don't have them side by side. Rookie mistake. Um, anyone notice what it is? Go ahead. Yeah, you, you know, this was a six-point Likert scale, you know, or a six-point scale. So you have three degrees of negative and three degrees of positive. This is an odd Likert scale. And, you know, I, I have a picture of me and Georgia Loopy having a big fist fight last night about whether they should be odd or even. No, it's the, uh, um, the, the, my life would be way easier if you force people to do even scale Likert stuff. But Man, I'm now convinced there's a ridiculous amount of powers in the neutrals. Okay. So the problem with this, we're going to see in a minute, is the way humans process stack bar charts. That the neutrals in the middle are, are creating a little bit of a problem. So I'm going to show you what Dan Zvinka suggested. So here's you know, kind of my go-to way of showing this stuff. And somebody left Slack open. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm usually pretty good about that. Yeah, you've never done that when you've presented, right. <laughs> okay. So, so, you know, the first one goes, well, this is intuitive. Strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, st strongly agree. Not at all important, minorly, neutral, important, very important. What's this thing? over here where the neutrals are on the outside and the most concentrated values are on the inside. Let me explain if you haven't thought about stacked bar charts and the problems with them, is take a look at this chart for a second. It is showing overall sales, and you can see overall south, west, central, and east is ordered. And then it's also highlighting my stuff versus everybody else's stuff. Let's focus in on my stuff. Because it's important to me. It's my stuff. Can you tell me which of those bars is the biggest? No, but watch what happens if I change this. Now it becomes super easy. That's the problem with stacked bar charts. You can get the overall really well, and then you can only get the thing that's along the baseline. Now, 100% stacked bar chart, no problem, because you've got a baseline on one end and a baseline on the other end. But something like this, this earns a screaming cat in the big book of dashboards. Um, yet, yet you just had sound effect there, uh, Trina. Good, good, thank you. Because I can do a comparison of the outside values really well, because I have a common baseline. By the way, the way to tell if you're doing viz as well, can people figure the stuff out without the numbers being in there? And if they can figure it out, then you're working. If you need the numbers in there, you're not, you're not doing the viz well. So I can't compare the inside bars. So Dan made the case of if you put the most concentrated values in the middle, in, along the baseline, I can easily do a comparison. Here are the people that strongly agree or say something is very important. Oh, I'd like to see very important and important. Well, you can combine them and do that. And then if you agree with the idea of the neutrals being 
It, here, here's his concept. Somebody's neutral, and we said maybe the way to treat that is we'll say they can go either way. So we'll take half of them and make them negative, and half of them make them positive. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that's a possible approach. I don't know if I necessarily agree with it or not. So let's dig in and look at some of this stuff inside Tableau a bit. I'll show you some examples, and then we'll see how they're built. So um, here is the first attempt to look at this thing. And um, I can look at importance or satisfaction or any of these things and see how they work. And I use the Viz in a tool tip so you can say, hey, if I want to do these comparisons. What isn't really popping out to me is support for mobile devices. There are a lot of people that are kind of on the fence about it. So here's another possibility of showing it. And I can really see for that thing. So I've got the, the I'm, I'm able to do the vertical comparison and the horizontal comparison. So I can see uh, across different elements and um, to the, uh, and within the element. And Candace, you were asking, hey, I want to put stuff in the header and have some numbers. It can be done. So it's in this workbook. So we'll just kind of extrapolate that example from there and see how that's happening. Uh, here it is, if you don't care so much about um, overall positive, you know, different degrees of negative and positive. And I got to say, I think I'm kind of going towards this approach, which is, you know, put the neutrals on the side. Um, and here it is, the neutrals on the side with, um, with uh, four levels. So I kind of buy into having the more concentrated values in the center and the less concentrated values, but I think we need to have the neutrals by themselves on the side. This workbook is available. A couple of days ago, realized, oh, there's a better way to put the neutrals on the side. I'll have a, I'll have a blog post about the neutrals on the side. Very briefly, if you just want to see how to, this was created and what's behind it, um, you ne need to get to the point where you can open up somebody's, this, of course, is Tableau Public, download it, see how it ticks, et cetera. So if we're looking at this thing, I can see I've got uh, positive percentages and negative percentages. So, oh, OK, let's see. What does the positive percentages do? Oh, that's responsible for all the positive stuff. Well, let me look at positive percentages, and I'll edit it. And um, this, this is you know, where you kind of, hold on a sec. There we go, so you can make that a little bit larger. And then you see sum of count positive divided by sum of excluding. What I'm trying to do here is I'm saying I don't want it to divide by the number of people that did this, 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 and this. So I'm saying exclude the breakdown of, of, of neutral, somewhat dissatisfied, not at all satisfied, et cetera. But now we have to look in oh, we got to go to the next layer of the onion. So I'm, I'm essentially saying count up the people who said positive things and divide by everybody, you know, everybody who answered this. So I now have to look at count positive to see what uh, the way this is. And let's see if I can make that a little bit larger. There we go. And it says, hey, actually, oh, yeah, this is when I was doing the scale went from 0 to 4. So it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So if it's 3 or a 4, if it's a positive, if it's a 2, it means it's one a neutral. So I'm saying if the value is greater than 2, look at this person who responded. Did they give it a 4 or 5, uh, excuse me, a 3 or a 4? They did. Count them as 1. If they gave it a 2, count them as a 0.5, else 0. Then we say add them all up, all the people who said it. And then you count the positives, divide by everybody who answered the survey, and you're golden. So that's what's happening with um, those are the ideas for sentiment. And it's pretty easy to un unwrap this and see how it's done. And um, I'm still forming opinions on this, but I think I like that one the most. I like the concentrated values in the middle, and I've become a big believer in looking at the neutrals because these are people, if you're looking at net promoter score, as an example, the passives and things like that, these are the people who are, you know, with a little bit of work, they can become your, your, your advocates. 
So, wow, there are a lot of neutrals. What do we need to bring them over to the side? So that's what I've got for sentiment and um, So here's a blog post explaining the whole thinking. It's got the, the, the workbook. And then here is Daniel Zvinka's kick-ass article about this. Don't worry, this will all be available, downloadable, and you'll, you'll be able to get the links. All right. Um, this one has taken over a year to put together. It didn't take a year to write the blog post. It was, I knew it was going to take a few days, and it was just finding the few days to get that. But before. I show you the whole notion of how do you show uncertainty or lack of confidence. Um, I want to take a little cue from Adam Grant, where it is a psychologically safe space to criticize people who are supposed to be experts, superiors, your bosses, et cetera. So let's take a look at something really, really bad um, and discuss what's wrong with it. And there's one thing in particular I want to hone, on on, hone in on that I want you to find. We could, by the way, we could spend 20 minutes talking how bad this is. This is some of my early work, okay? This is a Steve Wexler, circa 2007. This isn't just a screaming cat. This is a rabid panther in terms of bad, okay? What we're attempting to show is the frequency of use of various learning modalities. This is something I did when I was working for the e-learning guild. By the way, you are looking at, I think this is Tableau 2.1. I go back to 2006 with Tableau. I should be so much better at it than I am um, with, with this much use with the tool. But the idea is to show, hey, how long, you know, the frequency of use of international users of e-learning tools versus USA and Canada. And there are nine or 10 um, really bad things about this viz. I'm looking for one thing in particular. So go ahead and, you know, um, strip me down and embarrass me, make me feel small, tell me everything, and we'll keep going until we find the thing that I'm looking for that kind of sucks about this viz. Go ahead. Any, any comments on ways that you might improve it? So yes? Oh, okay, that's good. You know, I've got numbers on the marks and I have an axis along the bottom. That's a great way to declutter it. Excellent, okay? That is not the thing that, that it will improve it. It's not the one I'm looking for. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's one of the things I wanted to do was allow you to compare for this particular category, international versus Canada. That's why I have them next to each other, but I agree, it's really hard to take in. Okay, it, it's, it's hard to grok. Go ahead. Oh, the colors are just nauseating, aren't they? I remember thinking all these things that I'm gonna put in are trying to make it easier. Oh, let me put these heavy rules in between so you can see this category versus this category. Oh, let me put a yellow band behind one thing and a gray band. All the things I was putting in to try to make it easier conspired to make it even uh, harder. What else about this? Think about, serve, uh, go ahead. You, you're absolutely right. I don't have any neutrals here. So if I've got, you know, if I've got um, often and sometimes, it's adding up to I don't need sometimes. That would be the biggest improvement, by the way, the biggest instant improvement. But remember what, what okay, I'm going to give one or two more choices, then I'm going to give you a major hint. So I was kind of hoping you'd get to what sucks about this early as opposed to us discussing all the flaws in my visualization. <laughs> but that, that's okay. Go ahead. Oh, that's excellent. I didn't even think of that one. We don't know what the N is um, in this case, which is, you know, maybe just 12 people or something like that. So we, we shouldn't have confidence in this, which is kind of leading to what I'm hoping people are going for over here. Uh, no, I think it's the, the showing overall the largest use to the, to the least amount of use. Okay? Go ahead. Sir, did we discuss this before, beforehand? No, say we never discussed this. I have not a plan. That's right. When you put a decimal place in this thing, it is suggesting 
a level of accuracy and confidence which is not there, which isn't even close to being there. You know, you say 54.8%. So before I get into what it is that you need to start showing, and why? Let me let me show you how I would clean up the viz now because this is this is this is stressful. Ah, that's relaxing. Stressful. Relaxing. There we go. Much easier viz, much less ink. Easy to make the comparisons. Easy to, to see the differences uh, uh, between the values and across sections. Okay. So. Here's a, a check all that apply question. You've just fashioned a dashboard showing the percentage of people that responded to a check all that apply question, and you are quite pleased with your work. In your preliminary write-up, you note that measuring adrenaline production, that's the one at the top, is ranked highest with 77%, uh, and metabolism is ranked second with 72%. Before presenting your findings, you ask one of your colleagues to review your work. And she asks, uh, what's the margin of error for those results? Not sure what she means. You ask her to clarify and says, if you were to conduct the survey again with a similarly sized group of people, how confident are you that you would get the same result? Clueless is how to determine this. And that was kind of me until about a month ago. Um, and then I read Ben Jones' excellent book, Communicating with Tableau. And he has a wonderful chapter that explains the process. So I am stealing like an artist. I am borrowing on his work, leveraging it. I'm giving him attribution for helping me with this, and Anna Ford, and um, Daniel Zvinka, and um, oh, Luke Stanke, I don't know if he's here. He's always good uh, um, people, and, and, and um, Cleveland and McGill, which we'll discuss in a minute, and Jeff Schaefer. But uh, clueless is how you determine this. Your colleague explains some very useful statistical methods built around the mean limit theorem and how to use a simple formulas can help you state a range of values for your survey results. You thank her profusely, you do a little research, then come back and tell her that with a confidence interval of 95%, the range of values for adrenaline production is in fact 72% to 82%, and the range for metabolism is 67% to 77%. Let me explain what that, I'm gonna explain what that confidence of 95% means and the confidence of 99% means because I didn't, I didn't get it right about five times until someone said, no, this is what it means, and hopefully I'll be able to explain it clearly for you. In any case, I just want to kind of walk through the different formulas that we're going to need, and then I'm going to explain you know, what 95% confidence means. Okay, that at the top, that's how you do a check all that apply question. You do, you're counting up ones and zeros. So each person either checked it or they didn't, one or zero, add up all the ones, divide by everybody who uh, responded, and you get a percentage. You don't need to do a table calculation. You don't need to use count D. You rarely need to use count D. Why am I bringing this up? One, count D is a more expensive calculation, and two, if you deal with weighted data, which I'm not getting into now, you're going to be an unhappy person. Whereas with this, you'll be a happy person if you're dealing with weighted data. Okay, here's the magic formula that we're gonna need. So CATA, C-A-T-A, -A, is just short for check all that apply. Here's our standard error. This is the stuff that I read in the statistic books. Um, uh, Naked Statistics is excellent. Ben Jones's book is excellent for explaining this. But it's that thing there. The percentage of, the square root of the percentage of people that selected something times one minus the percentage divided by the number of people who answered the question will give you a confidence interval, an initial confidence, you know, saying that you'd have you know, like 68% will, will fall into this range. Okay, this is the magic number that you multiply this by that would be the equivalent of 1.95 standard deviations, which would mean 95% will fall in there. Here's the multiplier to get a 99% confidence. And then a variety of things, which is the CATA margin of error, which is the standard error multiplied by the 95% thing, or the error for the 99% would be the standard error, which we have here, times this multiplier. And then to get the range, it would be check all that apply minus the standard error, or check all that apply plus the, 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 the margin of error. So there, there, those are all the formulas, and let's see what we've got. And 
I'll show you what I built. I'll show you some different experiments with this, and you can decide which ones work and which ones don't. So let's start here. Here are the survey responses. And if I want to show, hey, I'd like to show um, uh, 95% uh, the, you know, confidence of 95%. Now, let me explain what this means. It doesn't mean that 95% of the time the value is going to be between here and here. It means if you were to do this again and again and again, that range of values you're showing, 95% of the time, the true value, the value of the actual population that your survey represents, will be within whatever um, uh, margin. Because if I, I did the survey again, it isn't going to be, you know, it might be 76% going to 83 and going to 71 or something like that. It's not going to be, it's not going to mean 95% of the time. It means if I do this again, that particular s survey set, will come up with a different thing. And if I did this 100 times and came up with all these different ranges, 95 times out of 100, the true thing will be there. So is this one of the 95 that's correct? Or is in fact maybe this is the one time where the actual value is a little bit ahead or a little bit behind? So that's why some people want to know, I'd like to have 99%. So let's give them 99%. And I read some uh, research, I can't remember the researcher's name, um, and he made a case for this particular way of visualizing this. He said because you could show both 95 and 99 at the same time. So here's 95 and 99 at the same, isn't that kind of cool? Isn't that nice? And very little ink, and it's pretty easy to read, but kind of thank you. The, 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 I'm going to show you different ways of showing this, some of the experiments. I'm not going to show you all the failures. Way more failures than, than experiments. But um, if we look in here and see how this thing is built, uh, by the way, Candace, again, you know, here it is where I've got a bunch of things that are in the, you know what you call the thing that's, on, you know, that's along the left side? you know, everything that's here, adrenaline production, the kata, and the plus or minus. What do you call this thing that's along the left side? The header, the header. yes. And, and the thing along the bottom, you know what you call it? The header. Anything that surrounds a chart is called the header. Discuss. Um, <laughs> in any case, all that I've got going on here is I've got the percentage check all that apply is done as a circle chart. And then I've got two measure values here. One measure that says, show me the lower level of, of error. And then the higher level, and I just make it a line chart, and I'm drawing a line between the low and the high, and that's how the thing is being produced. And I think it works pretty effectively. Um, uh, this was um, an attempt that is in um, Ben Jones's book, where he wanted to show, uh, he's using reference lines that are showing up there, and I remember seeing this, and I said, it looks too much like TIE Fighters from Star Wars. <laughs> so you could do it, possibly do it this way. This proved, you know, this was a little tricky, you know, that, that, that you know, you kind of have these very narrow uh, bars, and actually, it's a shape chart, and I've got three different shapes. So if we look at the shapes, I'm just using a, a, a little, using circles and the things that are there. Um, this one, one, I was really excited about this one for a while because I really like the name. You know, every person in data visualization wants to come up, you know, name their own chart, you know? And I said, oh, wow, I will go down in life as the inventor of the fingernail chart, okay? <laughs> okay? And, and do you see it? Do you see the fingernail, right? Yeah. A uh, couple problems. One is someone else has come up with this chart. I just came up with the name for it. And two, it's a lot of ink. You know, it's a lot of, you know, heavy bars uh, for doing this. All right. Um, I was late to the game of the importance of showing um, uh, confidence. And I would hope you start doing that because people are going to make a decision saying, oh, it's this. This was ranked number one. And this was ranked number two. Yeah, but, you know, we run the survey again. It could be, you know, within this margin. So I want to show you what happens when you have really low counts on this stuff. Okay, so I've got um, 
uh, hey, do you measure adrenaline production, metabolism, blood pressure broken down by these different demographics? And I have the end count sitting in there. And look at the end count for traditionalists. Do you see it? Oh, hold on a sec. I paid for this cool thing. Let me. Oh, let's see. By the way, this isn't too awkward, is it? Coming out here so I can see what's going on on this. Okay, you can see that there are only 14 traditionalists. Take a look at what your error level is. Oh. 57% indicated they measure it, plus or minus 26%. It's totally useless, which is why you probably want to build something into your visualizations that either have a, you know, you know, a X, something that says don't do this, or, you know, I can hard code something like this into it, which is I need a minimum of 25 responses. I don't want to get into the Minimum of 30 responses, no. N times P divided by this has to be greater than five, or such and such is greater than 10. That's easy to program in here. But the point is, look at just how ridiculously useless that st stat is when you have a small N count. So you should, you should definitely have that built into your stuff. Let's see, we got, I may not get to, I've got two more things to do. One's fun and easy. I hope I get to the other thing. If not, you know, I'll blog about it. There'll be step-by-step -step instructions. I do want to leave a little time for Q&A. Okay, so let's dig in. And, you know, if you don't want to wait for when this stuff is available. I hate the idea. I'm going to show you the slide, and it has the URLs. And it's, it's, it's the idea of someone actually typing that crap in, as opposed to, no, here's the slide, you just click it, so take your pictures. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I see a couple of people taking pictures, okay. All right, how many of you have heard of uh, the term bands or big ass numbers? Okay, record, that's my, I'm the guy that came up with that term, okay? <laughs> that's me. All right? I want you to know that, right? And I, I'm not just saying just a number out of context. I hate seeing dashboards where there's just a big number and it's not doing something that is helping facilitate understanding. Right? But that term, big ass numbers and bands, I coined that. And now I'm going to coin another term, basses, or big ass surveys. <laughs> OK, so. Um, let me find a big ass survey for us here. Yeah, this is a big ass survey. Um, I'm at the point now where I don't stress out too much when I get ridiculous data sets, um, but I've gotten some tough ones, and, and this one came from a, a, a hospitality entity, and it was the biggest biggest ass, biggest ass survey that I've ever worked with. Um, curious, what is the most monstrous survey that you've ever had in terms of not, not the number of respondents, but the number of columns? Okay, do we have any taker? Go ahead. About 3,000 variables. 3,000 variables, that's, that's a big ass survey. <laughs> Go ahead. 13,000 13, columns. And, and okay, can anybody top that? One of my colleagues said he had uh, 32,000. Um, the largest one I've dealt with is 16,000. If you're thinking, how does something like that happen? What, is that some unique form of hell that you put somebody in? <laughs> okay, uh, we're, we're interested in having you work for our organization, but we'd like you to take this 32,000 question survey. And, and so let me show you what it looks like so you don't panic the first time you see it. So you start looking at this stuff, and you, know, you see response ID, and you see the IP address, and a whole bunch of stuff that I never understand why it's actually in the data that we download. And you see this, and then, oh, OK, here's, look, they put SAT in there. It probably means satisfaction. And then you look at this and go, oh, wait a second. I'm seeing like this thing again, and again, and again and again and again, and it's like, oh my God, it's going on forever, and here's what's triggering it. I'm not even gonna go into presenter mode. You might have a, so this usually happens when you are doing some type of brand comparison, where you're saying, hey, 
we're doing a comparison of different airlines. Here are 152 different airlines. Indicate the airline that you fly on most often. I fly on Delta most often, United, uh, American, et cetera. So now they know that I fly Delta. They're going to ask me a whole bunch of questions about my experience with Delta. But you in the back, let's say, you fly United. You're going to be answering questions about United. And then you're going to say, hey, what are the satisfaction questions or net promoter score questions comparing this and this? So what happens is you're, in fact, stitching together 185 different surveys, one for each airline. It just becomes this really wide thing. So what this would look like is something like this. Which airline do you fly most often? Zopin, Air to There, Wing and Prayer, whatever. And, and these different things, then you might be presented with something that looks like this. Okay? Oh, indicate your satisfaction with Zopin, with air to there, or whatever, and then you've got these different things. So really all that has to happen, and there are a variety of ways of doing it, is in your, uh, and, and in your question helper, you're going to see these same things repeated again and again and again. You're going to see, oh, these are questions about price, cabin ambience, 24-7 support, but they're associated with Zopin. So you have another column, the preferred airline. They're associated with air to there. They're associated with wing and prayer, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a little more prep work, but then you can do some you know, similar data. You can uh, do some pretty cool stuff with it. I'll show you some examples of what we can set up. Let me see if I can find that. Sorry about that. That's Slack. You know, now might be a good opportunity to close it. There we go. Uh, let's see if we can find that pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, here we go. So you set up your data just so I can say, hey, I want to look at just the satisfaction questions, and I want to look at wording, percent top two boxes here is just, I'm not saying that's the way you should always do it, but if the value is greater than or equal to four, count the person. If not, don't count them, divide by the number of people. So I'll put percent top two boxes there, sort in descending order. And then if I put the preferred airline up here, I can compare these, these things. That's not a great viz. The way I would, um, um, this is a good way to show the differences uh, among the three airlines. And you can you know, highlight this one versus this one. I could have sworn I closed it. You saw me close it, right? <laughs> Notifications are always a little bit behind on my machine. Um, now, that's fine for two, three, four values. What if you're comparing like 180 of them? And so let me show you a couple possibilities for this. Actually, one possibility. One, I'm a huge fan of jittering and having all these different, you know, what I want to see is how is, you know, our brand doing compared to all other brands? So one is a jitter plot, and the other is, um, uh, this is called either a Wilkinson dot plot or a uh, unit histogram. So I can see, do you see the little green dot? It's doing really well compared to all the others. You know, it's, in the, you know it's, it's way above the 75th percentile. It's kind of an outlier in terms of gooditude versus baditude. So it's a, a, and people love this, seeing where is our brand in respect to everything else. So uh, a jitter plot or a Wilkinson dot plot or unit histogram. Um, I'm just going to show you kind of amusings of this. I'm not going to have time to get into the, uh, the meat of it, but the, um, this notion of, gee, I want to cut the data certain ways. You, know, you can think of, usually in a survey, if, it's not, if not every question is required, you probably start the survey with, hey, I want to know a little bit about you, because you want to make sure those questions get answered. So you have you know, gender, ethnicity, education, location, income, whatever, the demographics. There's nothing that says you can't also make something else something that you want to cut by. The problem is you don't always know what you want to cut by. Now, there's filtering by something, and then there's showing the division by something. 
And I'm not a big fan of filtering by things. Let me see if I can explain why filtering leaves stuff out versus breaking down by something. Uh, let me find, let's go to this question. Let's just look at air to there. Uh, keep only. And gee, I'd like to filter this by gender. Here, I'll give you your numbers. And I want to see what men think. No, I want to see what women think. The problem with this is I can't remember what the chart looked like when I apply the filter. So what I think would work better is you're showing the breakdown, you're showing the different things. Not that the bar and bar, not that clustered bars is the great best way to do it. It isn't. But what I'm getting at is filtered uh, versus um, breaking down by. That said, I do like this. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. Um, this has come up quite a bit, which is how to show the difference between the target population and the entire population. So, hey, I'm just interested in you know, women from Europe and North America. So the gray is the entire population, and the green is the target population. You can see where it's greater than and where that it's less than. And there's a whole blog post on how to do this. Speaking of which, there's a whole blog post on how to do uh, filtering or cutting by a, any one single question. Gee, here's what do you measure? I, you know, indicate what you measure, check all that apply, and I want to filter it by another question. Do you plan to vote in the upcoming election? And I just want to see what the yeses, uh, the folks who said yes, have to say. Or, hey, I'd like to filter this by uh, satisfaction question, and I just want to see this by people who are very satisfied. Again, I'm not at a biggest fan of this as I am with this showing the breakdown. So figured this out, got the step-by-step -step instructions. The thing that's been the bane of my existence has been how you filter something by a check all that apply question. And very briefly, I promise within two weeks, step-by-step -step instructions. But essentially what you're going to do is you're going to take your beautifully reshaped data, you're going to bring in the check all that apply questions again, reshape them, now, there were nine check all that apply questions. I'm going to end up having an additional nine rows to my data, one for each thing. And it's going to create something that looks ridiculously stupid, which is you're now used to seeing you know, your respondent IDs a zillion times and saying, hey, respondent number two is a guy who lives in generation X. And now you're going to see over and over again for each question, hey, how did this person vote? I'm going to see these check all that apply questions again and again and again. And I'll just show you what's coming down the pike and how to deal with it, because it's, it's pretty nifty. And, and, and it's not difficult. You, can, you, you, know, you don't have to use count D. You are going to create nine times as many rows. But I want to show you what, it, what it's um, um, the screaming cat visualization. Um, do you plan to vote in the? Um, uh, Check all that apply for general and production. This is overall. Yes, no, don't know. 52%, 34, 13. 52, 34, 13. This is the people who checked adrenaline production. And overall, it was 52%. But the person who checked this, it's 51%, verse 35, verse 14. And here, people, the, 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 the yeses for pupil dilation, much less likely to vote in the upcoming election. The other cool thing about this is that um, these yesers for adrenaline production, 75% of them are check all that apply. Uh, excuse me. These yesers for vote in the upcoming election, 75% of them are adrenaline production measures. And these don't know, 83% of them are uh, adrenaline production measurers. And Here's the way I would probably do the breakdown. So I can see um, this is the general population, and these are the people who checked 
that they measure galvanic skin response. And this is the general population, and these are the people who chose pupil dilation. So it's coming really soon. It's just not quite baked yet. But in a week or two, there'll be a whole blog post. And the recipes are pretty easy to follow. You know, it's just mostly copying and pasting. So I do want to leave a little bit of, oh, hold on. Let me just you know, do the, uh, the, the follow up on this. I'll have a new blog post on this. Um, a couple things. You can let me know if this is important to you or not. Everything that's in here is in response to someone sending an email or calling me up and saying, how do you do such and such? So here are some of the things that are coming down the pike. One is using anyone using Google Forms for survey data? Come on, raise your hand. All right, we'll have a support group a little later <laughs> on that. And, and it's, 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 it's eminently doable. Um, cutting by the check all that apply questions that's coming. I will have a better way of putting neutrals on the side. The other thing that's really close to happening is how many of you deal with weighted survey data? How many of you take a trip into a statistical package to process the data to get the weights? How many of you would like to totally avoid doing that and never have to use SPSS again or any of those tools? Um, two things. One is you can probably do a fair amount of it in Tableau prep lightweight weighting right now. You could certainly do it in Alteryx, and when it comes, and you can ask Jock about it or Ellie about it, you know, and say, when is this coming? And they'll say, sometime. Um, our integration with Tableau prep. So you're going to be able to do everything. You're not going to have to do that. And then what would you like to see? Also, where to learn more. Okay? Pretty much everything, 80 to 85% of the crap that I know about this, I publish at datarevelations.com. There's a page visualizing survey data. So th that is where you will find these things. You will notice that if you go to the site, if you attempt to leave the site, it will say, would you like to sign up for a newsletter? It's, that's how you'll find out when there's a blog post about something related to this. So data revelations, and there's a whole page with all these how-to instructions. How many times have you seen this this week? But with different color backgrounds, right? I chose the red one. Please complete the session survey from the screen. And I will leave this here. Um, here's how you can contact me. You can follow me on Twitter at, at @bizbizwiz. That's when it was like cool to have a cool, you know, a, a funny, mirthful, uh, cutesy Twitter handle. Um, but there's my email address, and there's the website. And in a couple minutes, do people have questions? Every single question that you have about survey data has been answered. That's fan, no. Anyone have a, a public question way in the back? I'll take a couple of public questions, then we can uh, all have drinks up here. Thank you for the presentation. It was really good. Um, some of the data I deal with, survey that I deal with is you have, your, you have like five columns of demographic data, and then, you, and then the data structure is if we use transport as an example, just say how many females use car to go to work, how many male use cars to go to work, and then there's like a total, which is redundant column, but they do it for like 50 times, like cars, trams, trains, and I'm just wondering, is there a way where I can com easily combine male and female per? So, you, so the, 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 you, you've got, you, you think you've got redundant data? Um, unnecessary yep. number of columns that are in yep. there? So, in, so right now, using prep, what I do is I just literally manually um, select both the male and female. I pivot it, and then I get rid of the minus underscore M or underscore F. Mm -hmm. And then, that's, and then I, I do that like 50 times. And then I combine it all together. And I'm just wondering, is there an easier way of handling there, that? There probably is. I'd have to look at it. If okay. you want, send me a note, and we'll look at it Thank together. You. You, know, um, you know what? Let's do this, because I'm, I'm let's see, right at the, one more question, then, then um, people want to be, whatever. Let's do this. Thank you very much. Delighted to have you here. You've been great. Yeah, people want to go, let me be polite. Let me give the guy his applause. Stay if you want to hear the question, and if you have private questions, come on up, but I'll take another couple of things. But if people want to bolt, get to the next thing, get some lunch or whatever, I totally understand. Question over here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, just a quick question. Do you have any best practices for showing verbatim responses? So Ooh, yeah, the, like... ver the verbatim stuff. Yeah. Okay, I almost got out of here alive. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, 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 I'm such a snob about these things because I, I did a lot of work with computational linguistics. You're going to need to do some pre-processing these things to put the things in buckets. And I'm just disappointed that the stuff isn't where I would love it to be. A lot of people use, there are a whole bunch of different tools, you know, Rapid Miner, Odin Text. Um, uh, you can name another, lots of Python scripts for figuring out how to take these things and put them in. And that will probably come after weighted data. It's like, okay, I, I need to get, you know, a bunch of, so the weighted data is not just me writing that crap, okay? It's me finding people way smarter about that stuff and, and working in groups and saying, can you help me with this? Um, so we'll probably do the same thing around that. So sorry, I don't have, uh, I don't have any joy for you yet. All right, thank you so much. It's been delightful. And Ellie, thank you for the lovely introduction. It was a pleasure.